Um, the next sources um, in which we can draw some ideas about um, the qualities and status and bad conduct of of Roman um, men and women are um, taken from a variety of um, sources and types of source. So um, source three um, is our friend Libby again, historian. Um, this is much later um, in his history of Rome. Um, so remember he's writing first century BC and he's looking back at various events in Roman history. And this one is about a story um, that was happening um, during the Punic Wars with Carthage in the third century BC. Um, so the wars here that are mentioned between the great troubles of the wars um, are the um, are the Carthaginian or the Punic Wars. Um, so this story essentially just gives us a, an insight into a time when um, some women actually fought back. Um, it's a rare example of women protesting um, politically in a way. Um, so um, because of the laws that were happening, um, that much money was needed for um, the army. And as a result, some laws were passed. The Oppian Law was passed um, in which women were expected to um, to um, spend less money or um, on um, luxury items for themselves and um, and put lim limits on what they could have. So here it says, it decreed that no woman should either possess more than half an ounce of gold, wear multicolored clothes, or travel in a carriage in the city or in a neighborhood within a mile of it, unless celebrating a religious festival. So this law was created um, during a time when um, finances were tight for the state of Rome as they were fighting the um, Carthaginians. Um, and most women, um, you know, followed these laws um, and did their bit for the um, for their state. However, over time, the Romans were successful, and um, they managed to um, to um, get back into peacetime. And um, however, the law still stayed in place. And it's at this point where the women um, started questioning why that might be. Um, because surely, if the why would they have to be giving up their luxuries when Rome is now in a time of peace and prosperity? Um, and other laws had been repealed, um, you know, that applied to men, but it seemed that the women were being targeted. And so, um, so many of the wives or uh, women would go to their fathers and their husbands. So we have here many noble men came forward to speak for or against it when it was proposed that um, a repeal should um, should be put in place so that their law should be taken away. And it seems that this caused quite a ruckus in Rome at the time. Um, so they filled the Capitoline Hill. Um, and um, to debate this issue. And here I think is, uh, is a really interesting section talking about how the women could not be kept in their homes, not by persuasion or prudence, nor the orders of their husbands. They instead blockaded all the streets and routes to the forum and pleaded with the men, um, saying that the state was flourishing and men's personal wealth was growing, so they should allow women to have their former findings returned. And amazingly enough, uh, this actually was successful and they managed to persuade uh, one of the consuls, Marcus Porcius Cato here, um, to repeal the law. Um, so a rare example of where women actually stood up um, and fought for a little bit of equality, um, which is lovely to see because we don't often hear that in um, ancient Roman history. However, I'd like you to take note of the tone of Livy in his history. Of course, histories were never written by women in the ancient world. So we've got a male talking about this um, and some of the language um, that he uses when describing this event and the women themselves is quite notable. 
so here. It is insignificant to speak of. He almost doesn't want to mention this um, protest because he thinks it's insignificant. So it gives us an insight into the way women are viewed there. Um, also down here, um, before long, they dared to approach the consuls, you know, as if, like, how dare they um, get above their station? And so um, I think that's an interesting choice of language here. And then the fact that they found one consul who was easily persuaded. Marcus Porcius Cato is here being portrayed by Livy as somebody who um, is maybe weak because he's being persuaded by women. So I think that's something to take note of there. Um, the next one is another historian called Sallust. Again, he was writing in the first century um, BC and also into the first century AD. And he here describes um, the, um, uh, he, he wrote um, a, a history about the conspiracy of Catiline. And Catiline was um, somebody, um, a kind of a, a patrician who in the um, first century BC, um, during the time of the kind of uh, right in the middle of the kind of civil wars, um, was um, trying to overthrow the Republican government. And so he came up with this con conspiracy and was trying to persuade uh, many different people um, to, to uh, um, you know, make an alliance with him and was um, making promises um, to them and, and offering rewards if, if they did. And so um, it's a very famous conspiracy in Roman history. Um, and um, and this part of the um, Sallust's um, record talks about the involvement of women in the conspiracy, one in particular called Sempronia. Again, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the tone of Sallust here as a male historian when he's referring to the women. Um, I think this this is probably what's most significant about this source is the mixed kind of character analysis that we have of Sempronia herself um, or just of women. So in the first paragraph, it, it's talking about how Catiline was um, winning over um, men and even some women, um, you know, it, to, to be part of his conspiracy. Um, and there is an assumption then made by Sallust that um, these women were essentially using sex um, to um, to live a life of luxury, this use of by prostituting their bodies. Now, most of these women were noble women um, and were wives um, or daughters of patrician males. And so they weren't prostitutes. So the language that Salas is using here is very, very misogynist. Um, and then here again, very rudely, he says, when age began to limit their earning power, so obviously when they got too old, they weren't as beautiful, um, they then started to run heavily into debt because they're not getting as, as many um, uh, luxurious gifts, perhaps, or money from their male partners. That seems to be what M. Sallust is implying. Um he then talks about how um, Catiline was possibly trying, why he was using women. He thought he could stir up the city slaves through these women. Um, obviously, women um, shows their, their relationship <laughs> with slaves in the household the most. They manage their slaves. And so they have a lot of influence um, on their slaves. Um, the other way that women could perhaps influence um, people to get involved in conspiracy was either to ally these was women's husbands to him. So through the women's persuasion, they, they might be able to persuade their husbands to, um, to follow Catiline. And if not, they might then kill their husbands. Um, so um, the way in which Salas is portraying women in general is, uh, as I said before, very misogynist. Then he focuses on Sempronia, who was a woman who was involved. Um, again, notice how abusive he is towards this woman. She'd committed many crimes of manly audacity. Um, and then it talks about um, the fact that she was, you know, noble. She was fortunate enough when viewed in light of her birth. She was born into a very kind of noble um, family. Uh, again, beauty, ideal quality of women again, beauty. Um, 
or something. Here he talks about being well versed in Greek and Latin literature and music and dancing. So you might argue that perhaps these were ideal qualities of a noble uh, patrician woman. Um, because it says here these are associated with the life of luxury. Um, but um, then he decides to um, uh, some change in attitude um, towards her character. Here he starts talking about how careless she was of her money. She was lustful. She pursued men more often than she was pursued. He's very abusive towards her. Um, she was um, had debts. Um, he suggests that she betrayed somebody, that she might have even been involved in a murder, and that she had... Um, so so we have a very mixed character analysis because then the next line, he suddenly starts talking about the fact that she's intelligent, able to write poetry, to tell jokes. She could speak both modestly or seductively or boldly. She had considerable humor and much time. He seems to flip-flop between different attitudes. So when you're looking at this one and trying to think of can we identify what some ideal qualities of women are, you can certainly see what bad conduct of women is in terms of what Sallust um, is portraying. Okay, um, the next um, the next two sources are um, one is a poem and one is a legal speech about um, a woman called Clodia. Um, she also had a pseudonym called Lesbia, she, um, and uh, Catullus was a, a famous poet in first century BC Rome. And he famously had an affair with uh, Clodia. Um, and when he wrote about her, he often referred to her as Lesbia um, as a pseudonym so that he wouldn't um, be prosecuted for adultery because she was, in fact, a married woman. And Clodia um, was the kind of a famous it girl in Rome, first bench, century BC. She was married to a very... Um, a uh, noble kind of senator, very from a very wealthy family, but she had a bit of a bad reputation. She slept with a lot of men, um, and she had a reputation for that. Um, and um, and one of her affairs that she had was with Catullus. And so this poem here is really about, um, you know, the impact that um she had on Catullus, um, but perhaps uh. This is about, um, you know, some of the ideal qualities that we see in her as a woman. So things like, um, you know, your beauty, he talks about her beauty. But notice the focus in this poem is very much on her, on pleasures, on sex, on um, the fact she uses sex down here. Who'll submit to you now um, to be powerful over men? Um, she's using sex as, and her beauty as a seductive tool. So it's still portraying women in an interesting light. So perhaps we could use this as a, a evidence of bad behaviour. And then down here we have Cicero's famous speech um, in defence of a man called Caelius. Um, and Caelius was, had, had had an affair with Clodia and um, the affair had ended and maybe out of spite she had decided to accuse Caelius of trying to poison her. And so here Cicero, the famous orator and um, uh, lawyer, um, is uh, defending her. And in this, he essentially assassinates her character um, as a way of trying to undermine the charge that she's made against him. And um, in this, he essentially, this paragraph 49, talks about, essentially implies that she, again, uses sex as a weapon. Um, she, you know, he calls her a harlot, promiscuous, she's shameful, she's always kissing in public, embracing men, you know, she's brazen. And then down in 50, um, we have, um, we we kind of have been trying to, trying to pretend that he's not talking about, um, about Claudia, but actually he is, so that it's all very sarcastic. So when you read this, um, make sure that you understand the kind of sarcasm um, in his tone because basically everything he's saying he's essentially implying about Claudia and again she has the life and the habits of a prostitute it's shameful and wicked so we get insight into bad conduct 